Bandwidth for Change Log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. This is Matt Imonetti, and this is Go Time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. All right, everybody, welcome back for another episode of Go Time. It's episode number 39 today. Today's sponsor is TopTal. The hosts for today's show are myself, Eric St. Martin. Uh, Brian Kettleston is also here. Say hello, Brian. Hello, Brian. And the lovely Carlicia Pinto. Hi, everybody. And our special guest for today is uh, speaker, author, and CTO and co-founder of Splice. Please welcome Matt Amanetti. Hi there. Do you want to give everybody like a, maybe a little couple minute rundown of kind of who you are, the things you're working on, uh, what Splice is, maybe if people aren't familiar with it? Yeah, so uh, it's always a hard to know where to start. Um, but let's start with Splice. That's probably the easiest thing. So I, I co-founded Splice about four years ago now. And uh, we are located in New York and Los Angeles. I'm myself in, in Los Angeles. And uh, GitHub is a creative hub for modern musicians. And what we do uh, is kind of a mix of kind of Netflix for samples and loops uh, and GitHub for music. So we basically uh, work with music producers and we integrate with their own software. And as they create music, the same way you might be using Git to create your commit every time you save, uh, your entire session, the entire program, all the content you've been working on gets uploaded to the cloud. And then you can add collaborators uh, and you can buy content. You have a subscription system that lets you buy the, the right small elements to create the song uh, you want. And uh, we have uh, some of the top producers on the platform from Dead Mouse to uh, the people who produced for Chains the Rapper or even uh, the Zootopia song that just won a, a Grammy Award or at least was nominated for Grammy Award with Shakira. So the, the story behind that is that I started as a sound engineer. I, I studied sound engineering. And um, I did that for a few years. And I worked uh, in England. And I was uh, traveling a lot to Asia and to part of Europe and coming to California. And at the same time, I was doing programming. And I realized, wow, there's a... There's a really great life to have for me to, to have in California and um, to be a programmer full time. And at that time, I was very involved with the Ruby community, um, contributing to Rails and working on a project called Merb. And uh, I moved to uh, to the West Coast uh, and I became a full time engineer. And nobody really knew about my dark past as a sound engineer until I met uh, my co-founder in Colombia. And uh, we were at a conference together and we were talking about different ideas and uh, the concept of bringing the tools of programmers uh, to the world of music is something that we were both excited about, but it's also something I knew was really, really hard. Uh, and, you know, when you have two passions, it's 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 hard to choose. And I think with Splice, I was able to, to bring both of them together. Um, so that's kind of the, the backstory behind Splice and, and my involvement in Splice. You mentioned uh, Merb a minute ago. It, it's amusing to me that uh, nearly every guest we have has a background in Ruby in one direction or another. It's it's so funny to see the, uh, I don't know if migration is the right word because I don't know if everybody always leaves Ruby, but it's so funny to see the people that we respected and admired in the Ruby community, in the Go community, again, making waves. It's it's kind of fun. Yeah, it, it was great. I, I remember the first Gopher, uh, GopherCon uh, where I ended up seeing a lot of my close friends from the Ruby community that I've known for you know ten years plus now uh, being around. Not everybody uh, followed um, Go, and I think that's that's great. We have a lot of people also went to Elixir, uh, that went to Node.js, that went to do different things. But I think uh, Go definitely offered an interesting balance, uh, especially in, in in the context of Merb, where we're really looking for performance and we're looking for a certain way of writing code. Uh, and that's something that we really found in Go. I loved Merb. Thank you. I was sad to see it die or or merge with whatever. Yeah, merge. We, we, we merged with Rails uh, 
we were acquired. I don't know whether the right term would be uh, <laughs> nowadays. Um, but yeah, it was it was a great project. I'm I'm really proud of the work we've done, and and um, Yehuda kept on on doing exciting things, and and um, you know he, he used a lot of his experience with Merb to do things uh, in in the JavaScript community, and then uh, with Rust. And yeah, it's great to see people moving on and doing different things too. Um, that just reminds me that we lost Ezra, and yeah, the the great people, you know, Jim Wyrick and Ezra. It, it's very sad to to see those people go. We should start yeah. this show with some death and sadness. I'm so sorry about that. Yeah, we should not. <laughs> so you you so you started Splice with Ruby. Um, no, we, about, we did not actually. Um, so this is all go. Yeah, it's all go. Um, so we did have a little bit of Ruby. So the, the technical stack is interesting. Uh, right now, so we have desktop clients. Uh, we are on mobile, and obviously we have a really big uh, web presence with with web APIs. And um, since the beginning, I made the choice to use Go. At that time, uh, I had some experience with Go. I started Go around when it was announced, and I was just playing with it uh, for a little while um, until people at Heroku were kind of showing me what they were doing with it and kind of helped me understand Go uh, in, in a better way. And I was giving talks. So, so the day I, I met my, my co-founder, uh, Steve Matoshi, um, I was giving a talk about seven programming languages in 45 minutes. And I was going through, you know, the languages I was spending a lot of time on at that time. And it was uh, Clojure, Scala, and Go. Of the seven, these were the ones I was the most interested in because I wanted concurrency. We we push more than nine terabytes of data a day. We have a lot of people connected at the same time pushing a lot of data in different formats. We need to do binary processing and all those different things. So even before I started the project, I was looking at languages that would handle those kind of challenges. Um, and I decided, uh, my co-founder actually asked me, like, hey, if you were to build a startup, what language would you use? And I said, well, it would depend on the, you know, the, the project. But I do like the fact that Go is a great language to scale the team. Uh, it's, it's easier for me to give a piece of code, of, of Go code, to someone that will come after me and understand what I was trying to do. When with Ruby, for, for 10 years, I was struggling to get people to like, follow the same guidelines. And you could do it so many different ways. It's a great language, but it was not giving me this, um, this direction that helps when you scale the team going from like 10 to, to 20 to 30 to 50 and to 200. Um, so when we started Splice, um, I decided that we would start with an entire layer of APIs and it would only be written in Go. And we started with doing the views in Rails because it was easier for us at, the, at that point. And we very quickly ended up with Rails front end talking to our Go API and adding some JavaScript on top of it. Uh, and that really didn't really work out well. And then we had, you know, we didn't really want to spend too much time trying to scale the, the Rails layer. Um, so we switched to Angular 1, and now we're on Angular 2. Uh, so our stack is Angular 2 with TypeScript, talking to uh, Go APIs, and then um, C Sharp and Objective-C, talking to uh, the same Go APIs. Uh, and we are rewriting the client, and we're doing a lot of Go stuff at the desktop layer, and we're kind of taking things from a different perspective, and it's, it's very exciting. I'm, I'm really excited to, to show more of that in the next few months. You talked about it kind of having like binary analysis. Are you doing any um, actual audio processing? Yeah, we're doing um, audio conversion, audio processing, um, and basic analysis. Um, we do a lot of binary parsing and decoding at the file format. So you can think of it as like kind of a Photoshop file when you save a project. And we're talking about kind of like GarageBand, Logic, Ableton Live, all these different projects. They save the state into a binary format. And what we need to do is parse this format, which is not documented, and then create an abstraction layer, what we call an intermediate representation, which will be the same for all the different projects, so the, store those different states um, in different locations, in database, in memory, um, on JSON, different, different type of formats. And then we need to rewrite that format so we can work well with collaborators. As an example of that, you know, if you're working on a, on a song and you have a link to uh, a file that might be on your D drive or on a different external hard drive, inside the software, everything is linked with a hard link to the absolute path. But if I send you my project, you won't have the same path. So we need to change that to be relative. 
Uh, and we also need to do a lot of compression, lossless compression and uh, deduping so you don't end up like uploading the same you know, gigabyte of audio files every single time you make a save. So all of that is done in Go. And um, yesterday we just announced a partnership with Pioneer DJ. And Pioneer DJ, um, as a hardware sampler, kind of the old MPC type sampler, but you can do everything on it, it's Linux based. And uh, what we're doing is we also have our own beat maker that's just a web version um, of a sequencer, so you can make your beat and you can share with your friends, and it's really easy for people who don't know how to, to program music yet. And we added an export to this format. So what we're doing is from the web, you can download a format that can be loaded with all the samples and all that, and, and all of that is done in Go. Um, Go is really the main language we're using. I think we have the... M I'm actually not sure because TypeScript also has a lot of lines of codes, but I think the, the most lines of code we have right now is definitely in Go. And every time you use a service, whatever you do, uh, you're going through Go. And you haven't had any um, performance or latency issues with, with Go? No. Uh, latency issue, no. Uh, we had, I'm trying to think about the problems we might have had. Oh, one time uh, we abused the context and we were not cleaning up our context properly and we had a memory bloat, uh, which was an interesting problem. So uh, we were kind of new to, the, to the, the context package, which was at that time outside of the standard library. And the way it works is you start from, from the main context and then you extract a context off of that. And we were adding, uh, I think it was a request ID or, or user information on that context. And for some reason, we were not clearing that and we kept on adding more information to it and it was just growing in memory. And I think that's honestly the only problem uh, we've, we've had uh, with Go. When it comes to performance, uh, since the beginning, we've, we were very careful to stream all the data so we don't do any memory allocation. Uh, our servers run on about 15 to 20 megs of RAM uh, right now. So even though we're pushing all this data, we never use uh, a single process, a single API process doesn't use more than 20 megs of RAM. Wow. Impressive. And to be fair, this is, I mean, this is all the work of the Go team. It's not really us doing too much. We're just careful to use the right APIs. Uh, and we had really good engineers uh, at the beginning uh, people like Katrina Owen that really cared about refactoring and, and thinking through the code and, and architecting so we could we could scale the code. So we actually don't really go back to change and maintain our code. That's something that I knew would happen. I was hoping it would happen with Go. Um, but it's it's awesome to to look at some of my code or some of the code that other people wrote at the beginning and see that it's legacy code, but it works super well. And everybody can understand it. And we don't have to go back and like update it because the version of Go changed or because the library changed. The fact that we can only focus on design and new features is really freeing us from the maintenance and the code gardening that you might have to do with other languages in some cases. Yeah, so that's one of the things I think all of us love and relate to when it comes to Go that you can kind of fit the language in your head. And usually when you're looking at a code base, it's the domain that's stumping you and not the not the syntax right and not having to update because of syntax changes yeah like remember when ruby changed the way you index yeah. the hash <laughs> I, I was also remembering the when our spec changed from version 2 to version 3 i think there was a bunch of syntax changes for that package every ruby update was was a breaker yeah, that said, I do. I, we did have a small issue when we tried uh, Go 1.8. There is a difference in the way URLs are being parsed. And if you start with a slash, uh, it adds a dot dot or something like that. And I think that was the only time since Go 1.0 that I had a problem. But before that, I remember you, things were changing all the time. And I was so grateful because the, the Go team had released this Go Fix tool. So every time they would make a change, I could just run the Go Fix tool, and then it would go and, and update the syntax for me. So you've been running Go since way back when you had to use a make file and include Go's make file back in the R59 days. Yep, uh, when uh, you had to do os.r um, for the errors. Yep. Yeah. Um, but I was not really doing anything um, production ready yet. Uh, the first thing I did uh, was to do this CSI enhance. But uh, it was just a fun way of learning. And basically, I was blurring an image using the, the image package, which was not part of the standard library yet. And like 
you send a command and it would like put it back normal. And it was just like dealing with kind of lower level uh, image processing, which was fun because I didn't need to use external libraries. And one thing that I'm always curious with the people who run their own business and are using Go for their software is the hiring. Do you even bother to look for Go developers? Do you, or do you try to, or do you make a point in hiring specifically some number of Go developers with experience or you totally don't care and just hire good developers who will quickly learn Go? What's your philosophy? That's a good question. I I don't think we're looking we're looking at it that way. Like we're not really looking for Go developers. Um, we're looking for developers who are interested in solving problems that have expertise and will be okay uh, and willing to use Go. Um, that's that comes from the fact that we started pretty early on. We were one of the first companies being like fully relying on Go, and it was hard to find uh, people that had experience. So it's it's kind of a mix. Um, but overall, uh, my VP of engineering, Juan Pablo Buritica, is is looking at it from a, a human perspective. Like, is this person a good fit for the company? Is it going to be, or, or will she be challenged by what we're bringing to the table? And will they be able to develop themselves uh, through our technical choices? And we're trying to make things very uh, clear and explicit because Go is not for everyone. Um, recently, I, I sent a tweet and I was asking, like, what is the the first thing that you encountered when you started using Go that really prevented you from going forward? And um, it was interesting to see. I got probably 200 responses and, and a lot of them were Go path, not understanding Go path, where you put your files, what do you do with it? And uh, the other thing was, I don't understand how, like, the syntax just bothers me. I just don't, I, it feels like it's from back in the 70s or something like that. And, and I don't understand interfaces, and this is, this is not a good fit for me. And we want to make sure when we hire that our values of, of being explicit over implicit, being a bit more verbose but easy to understand, that performance matters to us, are very clear so the candidates understand what they would be doing with us. And also, uh, we understand if it's going to be a good fit from an engineering culture perspective. How do you assess that, if I may ask? And maybe I'm getting too detailed here, but at the same time, I think it's interesting. As an employer, how do you assess that a person would be comfortable with those, the features of the language you're using if they haven't been exposed to it? Well, I think it's it's always hard, right? An interview process is really... Uh, it's it, it's really a hard thing to go through for, for both sides. Um, so what we ask our uh, candidates to do is to take a, a small uh, test uh, in front end and back end. And, and basically, we send them the test in advance. And it's it's a challenge. And it's like, in the case of, of Go, it's actually something I released as a Go challenge a while back. It's like, here's a binary file uh, that contains some information. And it's kind of a joke. It's so like, it's an old a beat I made on this old hardware device that's gone. And now we uh, we just recover the file and we recover the text file that represents you know the, the sequencing of the beat. Can you decode it and make the test pass? By asking them to do that, which is not a really hard problem and it's not really about solving it, it's, it's about letting them write some code and us having a discussion after the fact and talk about the small things. And, and we talk about it, and it's usually pretty clear what people are excited about. I think it's pretty simple to see if, you know, for instance, things like, oh, wow, this looks very weird to me. I don't like using for loop. And then you can have a discussion like, why not? It's like, oh, I'm used to using an iterator in C Sharp or in, in Ruby or in Python. Um, why do you only use for in this context? And we can have a discussion about it. Uh, we can see if you know they jump onto refactoring and abstracting everything into small methods right away, and we can have a discussion about it. And you can very quickly go and understand the values of an engineer by understanding their background and what they care about. Um, so it's it's not perfect, but I'm trying to be as explicit as I can, and we can have a discussion about it. But if they know we're using Go, they already kind of know uh, the dogma behind it. That's a good explanation. I can see that. So the goal is really just to discuss how they went about things, not necessarily grading their ability in Go, because the assumption is that a lot of people are taking the test. This may be their first uh, orient to using Go. 
Yeah, absolutely. And even for people who know how to write Go, the test is not designed to see if they can write Go because we believe we can help them learn that. We believe everybody can learn Go. We also use Go uh, for QA. So we have QA engineers who don't really have a great engineering background. They're coming in as as um, QA people with no experience or little experience with programming, and all the QA is done in Go. So we use Go as a language that drives web drivers for the, the front end and uh, also drives our automation for the client, and all those tests are written in Go. And the reason we do that is because Go being a compile language, Go being a fast compile language, and having good tooling um, it's easier for those people to write code that gets checked right away instead of having to wait until the entire test suite runs. And that's something that's been very valuable. So we use Visual Studio Code, for instance, with the, the Go plugin. And as they write, if they make a syntax error, they will see it right away. There's also code completion coming in and all those different things. So we have experience um, helping developers learn Go itself. So we're not really looking for someone who's already an expert. And if we do find someone, that's that's amazing. But we're looking for people who can solve problems and can learn. So if you don't know Go, it's actually more exciting for me to do an interview with someone that comes from a different language. And in some cases, we tell them, like, take the test in your own language, and then we can try to put it together, or we can talk about it that way. That's awesome. So speaking of kind of like transitioning people into the language, um, you wrote an article about a year ago, Go is for everyone. I, I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. But before we do that, let's take our sponsor break. Our sponsor for today is TopTal. Hey, everyone. Adam Stukowiak here, editor-in-chief of Changelog. Our friends at TopTal have been sponsoring our podcast for years, and now they're sponsoring GoTime as well. We think they're one of the best ways to hire developers and designers, as well as one of the best ways to freelance as a software developer or designer. Head to toptile.com slash go to learn more. Tell them you heard about them on GoTime. If you'd like a more personal introduction, email me, adam at changelog.com. And now back to the show. All right, we are back talking to Matt Amanetti. So before the sponsor break, I kind of mentioned you had written an article about Go is for everyone. And you kind of talked a little bit about how, based on the creators of the language and the early adopters, how we kind of made a great sandbox for all of us who may be experienced programmers to play in. But we need to do kind of a better job of opening it up to more beginners, people who may not have, you know, five plus years of programming experience. Yeah, no, absolutely. That that's something that's extremely important to me, and and I think also to to the Go team. Um, we 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 heard about that in the last GoForCons, where if we want our community to grow, if we want our community to be inclusive, we need to be welcoming to everybody. And I think it starts by people who might not be yet familiar with Go, and we should not try to pretend we're better than everybody else because we're writing Go code. Um, and I think Go is actually amazing for people who are starting. I do believe it's an amazing language for people who are learning how to code. Uh, um, I know last week you had my friend Ron Evans on, on the show, and um, Ron and I love to work on, on hardware. He's, he's the one who really gets me always the latest toys and, and get me to, to write a bunch of code with, with my kids to write robots. And one thing we we're talking about is like Blockly. Blockly is a, is a project from Google that's kind of like Scratch that, that used to exist. It's basically a concept of visual blocks you put together. And uh, what Ron and I were talking about last week was like, hey, what we want to do is do this and export that to Go so people can learn visually how to code Go. And we believe um, Go is a, is a really good language for people who are just starting. Because even though a lot of people recommend languages like JavaScript, Ruby, or, or Python to start, those languages are hard because you have so many different ways of doing the same thing. And you also don't have someone that just tells you, hey, you're actually doing it wrong here. The syntax is off. And most of the issues you're having when you start programming are related to syntax. And having a compiler that gives you that feedback right away is extremely useful. Yeah, I'd agree. Dynamic languages... Um, we talk about how easy they are, but there's a lot of knowledge to in just setup and then runtime issues, things that should have been caught by a compiler but aren't, you know, and they're caught right. at runtime and it, it confuses people. I think in my early Go days, 
I didn't think it was a very beginner oriented language, but, you know, kind of same as you, we started in the, the make file days and, and things like that. But nowadays with the Go tool and everything, I think it's a, a prime candidate. And I love the GoBot stuff, especially. Right. I thought Arduino made hardware more approachable to people, but I, I don't think it holds a candle to uh, how easy like using GoBot can be in comparison. Right. Yeah, and going back to, to the blog post, um, I think what I was trying to say is that we need to change this image of us being the experts and, and you need to be an expert to use Go. Um, I think it is true that it was designed and it is used by a lot of experienced people and they helped shape the language in a way that we're not making the same mistakes that they had to go through. Um, but it doesn't mean that we have to, you have to be an expert to start, to start writing Go code. I actually think writing Go code right at the beginning is giving you a good base because the language is simple. And then you can go and, and go deeper into features that don't exist in Go. And you can understand things that you don't understand. But if you already know Go, you can actually take what you know, with the exception of, of typing, which is slightly different with, with interfaces, but you can take that and you can transpose it to any other languages and they would have the same features or close to them. Uh, it's much harder to go from another language to, f f from a language like Ruby to a language like C. The delta is much, much greater. So I find that Go is a good compromise in between things. And we as a community need to be very careful about how we talk about our language and how we talk about features and how we talk about the details of it. Uh, focusing always on concurrency, to me, is a bit of a, a mistake. It's true that for a lot of us, it's very important. Without it, we might not be using Go, but it makes it sound that you should only use Go if you care about concurrency. And going back to the Blockly example, I, I was talking with, with Yana from the Go team, uh, Rakhil on, on uh, Twitter, and uh, she was she was really excited about that idea. And she was like saying, yeah, but we don't even need to have specific blocks for concurrency. We don't need to show channels and select and all those different things. We can start with just the basics of conditionals and, and, and methods and functions. And that would be a very good start for anybody who's just learning how to program. I couldn't agree with that more. I want to say that you did a really good job with that blog post on Medium, the entitled Go is for everyone. And I think you're completely right. Uh, I think I didn't come to go at the very beginning. So when I came, I think it was very stable already. And my impression is that the language is very simple. Uh, the syntax is very simple and it's small. The keywords, the, key, the set of keywords is so small. It's very easy to, to learn and even to memorize those keywords. So it's easy to use. Um, I completely agree with you. You can write back-to-back -back programs without using concurrency. You can even ignore interfaces. You can totally functional programs without using interfaces. So you can use just the basics of Go to write completely functional programs. And then as you develop more, you can start incorporating those more advanced features. Yeah, and to be fair, looking at the code we have in production, uh, I think last time I checked, we had like 450 to 500 um, web services, so, so kind of endpoints, most of them are extremely simple in the sense of there's no much complexity. There are a few places where we do use interfaces like the abstraction around uh, storage and, and a few things like that. But most of the code we write on a day-to-day -day basis has to be simple. And when we do go through the, the code review process, so we do a mix of, of pairing, which we don't do too much. We only do it when it's a hard problem, but everything gets reviewed by at least two people within the company. and when you go through that, everybody is focusing on, is it clear code? Is it simple for anybody to understand it? Is it following the normal conventions? And that usually means don't do anything complicated. Every time we see someone using a Go routine, we question like, why are you doing that? Is that, is that maybe there's a better way. Uh, talking with people within the, the Docker team, I know that it's been one of the pain points. Like they overuse it in some cases, and it makes it hard for them now to maintain their own code. So we're trying to, to keep it as simple as we can. So um, I'm actually kind of curious, in the audio processing world, a lot of stuff is in C. Are you doing a lot of C Go, or are you kind of writing stuff in Go? 
Um, it's a mix. So I started this uh, library called Go Audio, uh, which is on GitHub, and I'm creating a bunch of small packages that I'm extracting from the work we're doing as Supply, so stuff I'm doing on the side to open up the world of audio to Go. Most of what people do when they do... So actually, let me take a step back. There are two ways of approaching audio uh, for most companies. One is to use Python. The other one is to use C. C is used for anything that's real-time audio. So if you use uh, an audio plugin like a synthesizer or uh, an effect, that is usually written in C, uh, C++ to be more uh, precise. And there's an abstraction layer for Objective-C that people might use if they want to write uh, specific Mac or iOS components, which are plugins, but most people still write them in C++ so they can cross-compile them between Mac and Windows and they might just wrap them. Uh, Python is used a lot for um, audio analysis, processing, um, and different things like that that are offline. And uh, a lot of data scientists really like to use Python for that. And that's the language they know, and they have a lot of, of great uh, libraries that were uh, written in C that are available in, in Python. What I'm trying to do is start building a set of libraries that can be used for people doing audio in Go. Go um, is much faster than Python, especially for, for the kind of things we're doing. Uh, it's also much easier to write, and it looks it, it feels nicer as an engineer, um, as a developer. Memory is really the, the big thing. Um, if you do real-time audio, you need to be very careful about not blocking, uh, and a garbage collector in Go is, is good enough. So uh, to, to give you a, kind of a preview of what we're working on, I wrote a, a demo synthesizer that connects to your audio software like Logic or Live in Go. And we did use a bit of C Go to do the bridge, uh, but the synthesizer works very, very well. I didn't, I didn't really hit any of the, the limitations of uh, the language or due to the garbage collector, there's a buffer you process and, and Go is really giving you a lot of tools. It gets a bit tricky because of the typing. So in, in audio, basically every single sample, so if you take a sound, let's say I'm saying a, a word, and within this word, within one second, when you do a recording, you will take a sample of the volume, the amplitude of the sound, every X amount of, of microseconds or milliseconds. In the case of uh, CD quality, you will do that 44,000 times per second. Now, each sample gets represented as an integer or as a float. And the, the problem is the depth of, the, of, those, um, of the samples or the, the range of the samples will depend on, depending on how you do it. So you might end up having a file that was recorded at 44,000 16 bit, and you might need to play it at 48, or you might have stereo and mono. And now you have to actually transcode all those things between these different. Uh, values and and Go doesn't make it easy for us to have an interface that allows us to say, okay, I'm writing this equalizer and I would accept any type of numbers. Um, so those are some of the challenges. And what I've been trying to work on with with a small group of of passionate people is, can we create some sort of interfaces and not just in the sense of of Go interfaces, but a layers of code of abstraction that allows us to write a bunch of things and chain them together in a way that would be both idiomatic and very efficient for programmers. And now when you're talking about the sampling, you're talking about the pulse code modulation? Yes, the, the PCM data, absolutely. So is that primarily what you work in as you try to you try to use PCM to represent the different audio channels? Yeah, so we're not getting real-time audio, right? So people working on the project, they, they save them, uh, we get the information coming into us as it, it gets available. So we need to do uh, analysis and we need to do compression on those information. So we work offline and that is the advantage of like, we don't really need real time. Uh, we've been able to do uh, real time audio processing with Go, uh, but we're still working on it. And so far I haven't seen anything that would make me think we cannot do it. But at Splice, our focus is really offline. So we have more than a million samples. Uh, I think we're coming close to 2 million samples that are classified, organized, and you can search. And we need to be able to understand those sounds. And we need to be able to transform them. Uh, we need to be able to process them. And all of that is done uh, in Go. And we work at the PCM uh, data. So even if you use a compression layer, you would then decompress and process the PCM data. And then usually, uh, which is the pulse code modulation co uh, information, and usually what you would do is you transform that 
using something like FFT to get a frequency representation. And then you can process that and then you go back to the PCM data. But I feel like everybody's going to get bored. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it's really interesting to me because um, right now, like we do video processing, but we do it in C++ and then all this kind of supporting stuff is Go. And one thing I've always been curious about is trying to do video processing in Go. But we leverage real-time threads heavily and things like that. So then we get into like OS lock thread. And What do you mean by real-time? Like, do you do... Um... Do you do video compression and processing in real time? Yeah, so I actually um, work for Comcast, mm -hmm. and we do real-time cable streaming, so multiplexing channels together yep. into one MPEG stream, basically. Yeah, so it, it gets interesting because the advantage of Go in that case is you can actually multiplex the, the work by having different Go routines take different part of the work, if, if it can be paralyzed. The, the the challenge really from what I've seen is getting the right performance and and the conversion the type conversion has been costly and then um, the tooling is missing right so that's why I'm writing all those basic uh, libraries so I wrote a wave uh, encoder and decoder I wrote an AIF encoder and decoder and and I'm writing those transforms that let you do like a low pass filter all those different things they're not really hard to write but they don't exist and when you have to do everything from scratch. It's a lot of work, um, like the encoding of a web file, for instance, in the world of audio between 16 bit and 24 bits, uh, bit dev is actually very different and you need to be able to support it. And most people don't really, they just want to, to play with it and they would just care about 16 bit. But if you want to do something serious, you need to be able to handle uh, 24, 32, which means that someone has to write and someone has to release it. And when you don't have anything in the standard library and when you don't have any tools or any libraries, you don't end up using the, the language. So while I don't think Go is ready yet to be able to write you know, any multimedia stuff from scratch, if your scope is limited and if you want to really understand things, it's a great, great way. Uh, for me, you know, a lot of the C libraries I've been using for years are black box. I don't really understand them. And going through this process forces me to go deep in the format, and that's something I enjoy, and I do that on the, on, in my free time most of the time. Um, to do that. And honestly, there's no reason you could not do it for video. Now, the performance um, might not be as good. Uh, I know there was someone um, I met I was working on JPEG. I think it was JPEG 2000 for video. I forgot how, what the name of the format is. But it, it was trying to do a real-time decoder of a very complex algorithm. And this, the people who write that in C usually even do optimizations, assembly uh, optimizations, to get better performance, which we can also do in Go, by the way. Um, but Go is not designed for that or is not optimized for that. So you don't really get to use some of the features you could uh, at the CPU level uh, the same way you would do uh, with, with C. Yeah, and that's sort of the thought is, is it's probably for a while going to take a, a bridge between Go and C, kind of handing off the, the real-time bits to C and having a lot of the support code in Go, it's just to kind of make it easier to maintain. But it, yeah, it's interesting, like the progression of a language, because when all of us started, you know, there were a lot of basics missing uh, as right. far as libraries were concerned, just interacting with things that we're used to interacting with, you know, a Redis library and things like that. Um, but now I think we've crossed that barrier and we're now into um, more of the complex space. Like, you know, people have been doing audio and video processing in C and C++ for, you know, probably as long as I've been alive. Right. So it's, it's you know, all that stuff is really kind of uh, stabilized and, you know, people have had time to optimize it and things. And we're just scratching the surface of that stuff and data science libraries and, and things like that. But I think I think we're starting to see people start to work on these types of things, at least for as passion projects. Right. I think that's the, ch that's the challenging part, right? You need people who are motivated enough to start writing those libraries so other people will come and add more to it. It's, it's easy to look at it and be like, well, there's nothing, so I'm not going to bother. But there's a lot of potential. And I think if we want the language to evolve, we need to look at further than what you know, Google is using Go for. And I think that talks also about, you know, going back to my blog post about Go is for everyone. I think it's time for, for the, the Go team to kind of let go a bit more and, and give more uh, freedom for people to work on the side of the language. 
Um, I know there's some discussions. We we had long discussions on on different uh, issues to have more of a work group on different things. I would love to have people who come and are interested in in media processing and they want to do audio and video. We already have a good package for images, but what if we were doing the same thing for other formats? And we don't I don't expect that to be the main use case for Go, but I love being able to play with my Raspberry Pi and do image processing for, for on it. And I would love to be able to do very basic thing uh, related to audio and video in Go too. So I don't have to to uh, to go back to C for those kind of things. But we need people to come in and say, "Oh, I'm interested. I'm going to learn those things." And it might not be perfect, but I'm going to contribute something. I, I see a question on the uh, on the Go Time FM uh, about. Um, onset detection and a lot of, of the, the music um, analysis tools that, um, that might be available for Go. And um, no, there are not a lot of really good tools yet, um, but they also don't exist in other languages, to be honest. Um, they, are, they do exist in, in C, and some of them exist in Python, and they're not really performant. And I think what's interesting is to learn those things and pour them into Go and, and understand how they fit the automatic way. So I saw a couple, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago now on Twitter. This is changing the subject a little bit. But you mentioned that you had done a prison outreach. Was that programming related? Um, yeah, it was a mix. It's entrepreneurship uh, related. So th this is a project. And, and if you're in the U.S., uh, DeFi Ventures, which is the group organizing those, those events, is um, present in 23 prisons. And what they do is that they organize trips to go to prison for an entire day and help coach people who are incarcerated and want to become entrepreneurs. So the, those entrepreneurs in, in formation, in training, uh, they call EITs, entrepreneurs in training. And they have a desire to start a business. And usually the business is not like, they're not trying to start a, a video compression company um, to help Comcast, right? They, 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 have, um, they have experience in different, you know, businesses, uh, might be taking care of animals or gardening or, you know, running a, a business with associates that sell different type of probably legal products. And they're trying to convert this um, this expertise that they have into uh, a job that will let them stay out of prison and, and really move forward and, and provide for their family. So I came at the end of the program where we were doing the pitch competition. So everybody would pitch their ideas. And it was a series of, of entrepreneurs and, and VCs that would give them feedback and, and pick the, the, the best projects. And then uh, they would get funded once they would get out. Uh, and it was a very, very interesting experience because, I mean, I explained in, in the blog post, I wrote a blog post about it, but after the, the U.S. elections um, in November, things have been a bit rough for me. Um, being a foreigner myself, be, being Hispanic, being married to, to a Latina, having kids here, seeing the, the racism and seeing how we were not really welcome anymore. And, and uh, even though we are Americans, we didn't feel like we were Americans anymore. Uh, and I was really questioning a lot of things and, and I was losing hope and going to prison kind of changed a lot of things for me because I met people who've been in prison for five, 10, 20 years who might not be get out for five, 10, 20 years. And those people had more hope. And let's be honest, they were screwed by the system. Like there are a lot of, of research on, on how come so many brown people end up in jail and, and 13th, which is the documentary on Netflix is really good at, at explaining those things. and. You see those people that didn't have a chance to be successful. They didn't have the chances I had. They're not privileged like I am. They end up in jail and they're so motivated. They're so excited about what they're going to do. And they're so happy that I just spent a bit of my time to come see them. I realized it was really unfair for me to, to give up hope. When I see people who've been screwed by the system and are still stuck and dream to be able to go out and build you know, donut shop and, and project of cleaning up hospitals, like all those different ideas. And they're so motivated to do it. And they're so prepared. They're often more prepared than a lot of other entrepreneurs I work with. And sometimes more prepared than me. And seeing that they were so kind and, and compassionate with other inmates, other uh, EITs was something I did not expect. Because, you know, you take any engineers, you take any uh, VCs or 
um, entrepreneurs, you put them in a room and you tell them, okay, we're going to do a contest and whoever wins, wins the prize. I can tell you it's not going to go very well. You're going to hear a lot of comments and things are unfair. These guys were amazing. They were supporting each other. They didn't, I didn't see people making comments or faces. And it was like, wow, if these guys can really believe in what they believe in, and I have everything on my side, there's no reason I cannot be hopeful, even though I still don't like the situation we live in. But I can help as much as I can. And I can also look at it from a more positive perspective so I can help more people by being positive. Now, I think it's really interesting, too, because a lot of people end up there, and especially people who are there for a very long time. And it's it ends up being like university for criminals where like they, they come out and there's nothing else for them to do. And the only way to make money tends to be to resort back to that. So to see people trying to put so much effort into making a plan for when they get out and do these things to kind of better their lives, you know, like that's fantastic. Yeah. And so when it comes to the stats, I think it was something like between 75 to 85 percent of uh, inmates coming out of jail go back to jail. But with this program and there was a full graduation program, they got a master from a a real university and everything else. They had to work really hard for six months. There's only a 3% of the inmates coming back after the fact, which is really amazing and proves that we're really doing something wrong with our prison system. Um, It's also the fact that it's very clear when you, you go to prison that the system is unfair. It's very clear that if you're a brown person, you're way more likely to end up in jail than if you're not. Um, they were asking questions and they were trying to show that to people. It's like, you ended up in jail and what you did is wrong. And nobody will say it's, it was right. But you also set up to end up there. And there's nobody that gives you a chance to come out of it and do something. Uh, and I think that is the part that makes a big difference because not all of them will be able to be successful with their startups. But they've seen that unlike the rest of their life, now people trust them, believe them and give them hope that they will be able to be successful. Now, is this just that one prison that does that or are these events held kind of around the country? It's all around the country. Uh, 23 prisons. Um, Defy Ventures is the the name of the organization. And Kat, um, I forgot her last name now, the, the founder is this amazing woman who's been working on that project for 20 years now uh, and, and really fighting to give a second chance. And it's not even giving a second chance is giving them the tools they need to be successful because those people are very talented people. They were just not giving the chance to do it. And anybody can go. Um, They have different levels. It can be just like helping them practice their pitch or or coaching. Uh, They teach programming uh, to people who are interested in learning how to program. But it's extremely hard. I mean, what I realized going to prison, I mean, I knew it would be hard and everything else, but they have no access to internet ever. Like no access. Like you want to learn how to program without internet? It's actually really, really hard. It's only with books. You also have no coffee, which is you know I should have thought about that. But there's no coffee ever in prison, which is something that surprised me a little bit and makes a lot of sense. But imagine a programmer without internet and coffee uh, <laughs> trying to be better. It's like that. That's like it doesn't really help. So if if you can find some of, of your time, and this is not about like going and, and saving those poor people in jail. This is about you learning a lot about yourself and also giving them a chance that maybe you got from someone else when you were a kid. That sounds like an amazing program. Then you should absolutely uh, give it a try. Yeah, I'd love to find one nearby. I'm, I'm on the website. Yeah, go to uh, Defy. So I think it's defyventures.org. Um, let me check. Defyventures.org. And I can. Um, it's linked also in my uh, blog post that I will give you a link for. Uh, It's definitely a great, great program. Um, I know one of my concerns was I was worried that we'll go into this place and kind of like feel like it's the rich people saving the poor people. Uh, And there was a little bit of that, but really not much. Overall, it was it was more about being equals and knowing that we're privileged people and they are not. And we need to share a little bit of what we have with them and, and give them a chance because you know, both the programming world, but also the world of startups and, and entrepreneurship is a lot has to do with understanding the rules of the game. It, it's really a game. When, when you program, you know 
what works, what doesn't work. It's, it's kind of a binary thing. But if you come from outside of the world, if nobody taught you the, the rules, it makes it really hard for you to be successful. Yeah, and the penalties for failure are extreme, even on basic things, right? Like it, getting into running my own business and accounting and stuff like that, the number of times I got dinged by the IRS or, or state tax places for some form I didn't even know existed needed to be filed by some date and things like that. Like it's real and it can knock people off the playing board pretty quickly if you're not familiar at least with the basics of how to kind of get a running start. Yeah, I was actually shocked. I, I, I met a, a gentleman who was really, really interesting and I was asking him like, so when you get out, like I'm really excited about your project. And he was like, well, I took 23 years. I'm like, why? What did you do? And um, he used to be in a gang, and he got caught, I think it was for, for drug trafficking, and he did his years, and he came out, and um, he got then caught with a gun. He didn't use the gun, didn't do anything, it was just for protection, but he had a gun on him, and that gave him 23 years in prison. And to me, that was kind of insane, um, because we were also talking about things like DUI. We had a lot of white people that were there, and um, they were asked, like, when was the last time you had a DUI, even though you're not caught? And it, most of everybody, if not everybody, admitted they drank under the influence within the last year. But if you get caught twice, and especially if you're a minority, you end up in jail for many, many years, and which means that your kids will be raised without their parents, which means they will probably do the same thing. And this is how the system is really broken. And again, uh, Netflix has a really great documentary called 13th that explains a lot of that. It's just, we need to accept that's the way our system is. We need to change it, but it will take some time. In the meantime, you have a choice to do something wherever you are. And I think that's what's important. I think as programmers, we live in a world of abstraction. And uh, even here, you know, we, we say we're, we're at the same table and we're having a discussion, but we're not. And going through this prison experience and not having a cell phone for 12 hours and being with people where they tell me, like, I don't remember last time I had such a deep conversation with someone. It's insane. I'm a parent. That's what the person was saying. I'm a parent. I'm married. I have kids. I realize now it's probably been 10 years since I had a deep relationship with people without thinking about all the things that came through my phone, my computer, my, my, my schedule. And we're losing that. And as engineers, I think we're even more disconnected because we had even more abstraction layers to things. And that's why it's so hard to work with other engineers because we know how to deal with code, but the, the, the communication and the social aspect is not being taught and often is not even being valued within our own community. I sound a little bit preachy on that one. Sorry about that. No, I no think this is, preach it. Yeah. Uh, everybody's just agreeing in silence. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of sitting here uh, thinking to myself, like, uh, this is something I, I really would like to get involved in. And, and you know, I, you don't have to go to prison either. Um, it's not for everyone. And by the way, men and women are welcome, and they're men and women jails, just to be clear. And... There are some rules, so you cannot wear some, some colors like blue and yellow and orange are not allowed. Women cannot wear uh, bras with uh, wires. Like There's a few things like that, but it's really open to everyone. But it's also a very intense experience. And there are other projects that exist if you're interested in helping. Uh, Nifty is another one. Uh, it's a project that teaches both programming and entrepreneurship. It's, it's a bit more entrepreneurship, but it's for kids. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, if you know how to run a project, you will be able to uh, help with that. Uh, you can participate to local events that you have. And I think the first step is for us to reconnect as human beings. I think most of us, and I know I am an introvert, and it makes it hard. I don't really want to go and, and hang out too much with people I don't know. But doing that also teaches you a lot about yourself. And when you come back to your code, you have a different perspective. And when you review code from other people and when you work with other people, you have a different perspective on coding, project, communication, and your priorities are also changing. Oh, this is great. So I think we've only got a few minutes left. Did anybody want to chat about any projects or, or news or anything that has come across your email or social media that you found interesting? Just before we jump onto that, I actually have one suggestion. Um, we, we just started doing something as Splice uh, last quarter, and every quarter we give a civic day to people. And that civic day is a, is a day off where you go and you help your community. It can be political or not, but then you have to come back and discuss it with the team uh, during our weekly town hall. And I think 
that's something you might want to bring up to your team, uh, especially because in the U.S., a lot of us work for startups. And uh, vacation time is kind of this weird concept where you might have unlimited vacation time, which means no vacation time. Um, <laughs> or, you know, people don't really want to take a, a vacation day to go help other people, even though it feels good. Um, I think you might want to bring that up to the different people to do it. Um, I think, you know, we were very um, receptive to it. And I think that's something that a lot of leaders would agree is really helpful and it brings the morale up and it helps things. So if you have a hard time finding your time in your own schedule to do it, um, go talk to your boss and potentially uh, try to get a, a day off, potentially doing it with the team. You can also do a project with everybody. That sounds amazing. Because uh, when you give and when you volunteer or you help somebody in any way, you feel great. And it's so great to go back to work. And now I feel great about myself because I did something good. Yep. And if, if the whole team is having the experience, it must be amazing. And schools. Schools would be another great place to volunteer your time. I love to do the Great American Teaching every year. That's, that's my favorite thing to do. Favorite day of the year. What is it? Can you tell us more? The, the Great American Teach-In. I don't know if they do it everywhere, but uh, in the schools around here in Florida, uh, they invite parents to come in and teach classes for the day uh, about the things you do at work. So let's see, last year I brought in a AR drone and we programmed it with GoBot and the kids, these were second grade kids, programmed it to fly around the room and then stop in the center of the room. And they were just blown away. They were amazed by the fact that they could control this drone with, with their own typing. And it's just, it's really fun. It's a great program for, for kids to get experience in things that they might not normally see. That sounds awesome. It does. Wow. Yeah. I don't think it's a national thing. I think it is a local thing. It might even only be the county, but yeah. Well then they shouldn't call it the great American teach-in. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know in California, you need to have like you need to go through a certain process to be able to interact with kids at school. Like, even though I'm a parent and have my kids in school, I need to go once a year. I need to do this special training before I can even interact with other kids. Oh wow! Oh uh -huh. yeah. And anytime you put some sort of barrier like that, it it makes it harder for people to get involved. Yeah, but it might keep some kids safe at the same time. So it's always a hard balance, right? Yeah, that's that's very true. Yeah. We have to do background checks before we can go to the school, and that takes weeks. So it's not just a simple process here either. So why don't we move on to our interesting news. Eric, uh, you were mentioning that a moment ago. I saw the coolest video on, um, I think I saw it on Twitter, uh, by Scott Lobdell. And I don't know where Scott Lobdell works, but he built a blimp that has autopilot that's controlled by a Raspberry Pi and Go. Nice. And... The, the video was amazing. He set up some GPS waypoints in the Raspberry Pi and programmed the blimp to try to navigate four or five waypoints. So we'll put the link to that in the show notes. It's, it's really cool to watch the video and even better to, to read the article about you know, how he evolved his code to learn more about flight and controlling that and you know, kind of the AI involved in predicting how things are going to work with a completely autonomous drone working from go. Did he do that in his free time? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, or a school project or something. It wasn't, I, he was an adult and I, I have this feeling that they were related in some way to perhaps the work that they did, but I don't know. I'm very envious right now. Right. Yeah, it, it's a really, really cool video and a great read. So along the same lines of Go and hardware, um, have you guys seen the Go Crazy project? Yes. Yeah, so um, have you seen it, Matt? No, I've not. So um, Go Crazy is apparently an all Go uh, user land for the Raspberry Pi. What's a user land? So, so basically, you, you have things that run basically in kernel space which is the operating system itself, and then kind of the things that you normally write that uh, everyday applications that run on top of the operating system are really user land. So it basically gets rid of um, a lot of like C applications and some of the, I believe some of the interactions with the kernel. Um, and it's basically all Go. 
That's interesting. So what's what's the goal? So first, I, I had a really hard time Googling it. Somebody sent me the link, but it's go crazy, G-O-K-R-A-Z-Y. Right. But what's what's the purpose of it? Like, why would you want to do that? Besides go is awesome and you want to use it everywhere? I think the... the if that may be it. <laughs> I think the purpose of it is really just to kind of have like a trimmed down operating system for the Raspberry Pi that only runs Go applications. I think they're marketing it as a security thing just because of the nature of buffer overflows and things like that in C. Right. It looks like they also have a web interface on top of it. So instead of doing system calls, you can make HTTP calls. Right. And it it seems interesting for doing kind of like home um, projects where you want to write the application in Go, but deploy it to your, your Raspberry Pi without necessarily using your Raspberry Pi as uh, you know a Linux device. So I haven't got to play with it yet, but it looks cool. Yeah, I'm excited now. Yeah, it's, it, it's on my someday list. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. It, it's on my open tabs where I have like 30 of them, like, look at this later. <laughs> and then they graduate from... I don't know whether it's graduate. They probably demote from there into bookmarks, which right. sit there. Forever. <laughs> and then once a year, I have to clean them all out. And I'm like, man, why did I never look at those? I want to mention um, Matt's Go Bootcamp book, which is online and free. Yeah. We didn't talk about it, but I wanted to make sure we mentioned it. It's, uh, I actually used it to learn Go when I was starting out. So thank you, Matt. <laughs> and it's open source. So... Um, you're welcome. Um, it's open source. It's, it's also on GitHub. So if you want to add any items to it, if you want to to make some changes, please feel free to send pull requests. And if you're interested in helping me uh, maintain it, I would uh, also really welcome maintenance since I don't have a lot of free time and it looks like I'm going to have to play with Go Crazy now. So I'm going to have even less free time. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I should look at that and see if there's any of the training materials that I've written over the last year that would be a good fit in there. I've got just tons of training materials. So I'll definitely go check that out. Awesome. One of my favorite things about the Go Crazy thing is that the tool that they use for you to to do like on device debugging, like where you actually need to SSH in, is called Break Glass. <laughs> <laughs> in case of emergency. <laughs> there was uh, one last interesting Go project that I wanted to mention because this one has caught me several times and I'm surprised nobody had thought of this, including myself before. But the Twitch team at, at github.com slash Twitch TV released a vendoring project for binaries. And I, I can think of dozens of applications that have binary helpers. And maybe the biggest one I can think of is Hugo. But there's also things like the, the uh, Protogen compiler and uh, other tools that you might need, especially in, in Goa, in um, Ponzu. A lot of the apps that I use have a binary component to them. And when you have a project that's versioned, it's silly that you don't also have the binary with it that's versioned too. So this tool is called uh, Retool, R-E-T-O-O-L at Twitch TV GitHub. And it allows you to to vendor basically your binary helper applications that go along with the uh, app you're building. And that's a brilliant idea. That's interesting. I I wonder how that works for um, different operating systems and architectures though, because you might need a different binary. They allow you to vendor the source code or the binaries, and uh, it, they've got that covered. Oh, that's cool. I'll have to look at that. Yeah, speaking of Twitch, I do believe they also do some video processing in Go. Uh, not too, too much, but I believe they do some. Oh, that would be interesting. Yeah, I know a lot of their chat stuff and um, I think some of the download stuff. They're doing a bunch of stuff in Go. I didn't know they were doing video processing in Go. I think they're doing s- some of it, yeah. And I think. It, I, I, it might not be Comcast. I thought there was another company who actually wrote an MPEG for uh, decoder uh, in Go. I would have to find it, and, and I'll send it to you guys uh, once I find it. But uh, I know when we discuss about video stuff, um, there was another company doing video processing in Go. It, it was pretty basic, um, but it looks like some other companies are working on it too. Nice. Yeah, and I've seen some MPEG transport stream um, libraries and stuff like that to do um like MPEG Dash and HLS. I've seen some of that stuff in Go. I want to say I saw the MPEG library too. Right. And it's quite possible it came out of Comcast too. <laughs> there's so <laughs> many there's so many different groups of people working on tons of things at one time. So uh, did anybody else have any other projects they want to talk about before we move into free software Friday? 
No. 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 Okay. So, um, Matt, if you're not familiar, um, every week we kind of do a thing called Free Software Friday. And um, basically, we just kind of give a shout out to a project or maintainer of a project that makes our lives easier. It does not have to be in Go. Um, this is just kind of our way to um, support and give recognition to people who make our lives easier because they may not hear it every day. They may just get issues. <laughs> right. So um, if you have anybody in mind, you're welcome to participate. If not, that's fine, too. Anybody have a project maintainer they want to give a shout out to? I'd like to give out a shout to GitLab, who is, um, uh, first of all, acquiring everybody under the sun, first matter most, and now Gitter, but um, still maintaining a very decent alternative to GitHub that you can host yourself and keeping a powerful community edition of it completely open source. So I, I did a GitLab install this week. I really enjoyed it, and I was surprised by just how much is in that GitLab install. So thank you to the GitLab team. It's quite surprising how, how much functionality is in GitLab. And they have everything. They've got CI, they've got chat, they've got Git, they've got GitLab pages now. Everything you would need to, to run your own, um, own version of all of the tools that we're using in uh, GitHub and you know, CI and all of that. Kind of nice. How about you, Carlicia? I don't have one today. Okay. And Matt, did you have anybody? Yeah, I do. Um, so... I'd like to thank Ramya. Uh, Ramya Rao, she's the maintainer of um, the Visual Studio Code Go plugin. So um, we had a Go survey the other day uh, that came back, and VS Code is actually the second most editor after Vim uh, for Go developers. Um, and she is not a gopher. She only started learning Go when she took over the project, and she doesn't even work full time on it. She, I think, she, it's it's a twenty percent time at Microsoft, um, and she's been doing an amazing job, uh, adding a lot of features and not getting the support of the community that she deserves. And I didn't really know she was the only one working on it until I contacted them, and I realized, wow, she only spent you know a bit of her own free time. Uh, making this this Go extension better. And she added so many things. The debugger is better. You can generate tests for a function of an entire file. Uh, she's been working with different uh, people to implement the right tools. And I think, you know, besides the fact that she's amazing and she's doing a really great job, it would be really good if the community and especially the people using VS Code are uh, contributing, helping uh, doing triage on the, on the issues and uh, contributing to the discussions about what's valuable to them. So that's interesting uh, that you bring that up because I got sucked down this rabbit hole last night, as I often do, and I was playing with writing my own editor for Go, and I ended up on the Monaco editor uh, open source page mm -hmm. where I found, I think it was your issue, about um, a Go language server support from Sourcegraph for Visual Studio Code, and then I thought, Oh, that's right. I haven't really looked at that Go language server yet. So then the next thing you know, I'm cloning it. And then the next thing you know, I'm thinking about how to add auto completion right. and thinking about a pull request. And an hour or two later, I had a pretty decent Go editor built in a web browser. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's it, I, I do that sometimes, get kind of caught up in those little rabbit holes. But yeah, that yak just kept growing hair. Yeah, I mean, speaking of which, really quickly, Sourcegraph released a, a small um, package slash binary that lets you do code completion and references much, much faster. And that was integrated for Mac uh, with VS Code behind the feature flag. And yeah, big shout out to them, too, because uh, it's a lot of work that they made available to a lot of us. And that concept of the language server is pretty impressive. Language server protocol, LSP. And... I, I have a feeling that it's going to revolutionize IDEs in general. I, I can't wait. I, I noticed that there was a, a NeoVim plugin already for the Go uh, language server, although it looked relatively incomplete. And I'm excited to see all of the other languages that have already got LSP support. And even more excited that Microsoft created that as a standard that they're openly encouraging everybody else to use, and it's open source. and it's it's only good for us programmers. Right. Yeah, so again, thank you to Ramya. She's not on Twitter. Uh, you can. F I don't think she's on Twitter. She, she is, though, on top of every single issue coming in. So even if you just open an issue, if you use VS Code, I would suggest you open an issue and you just say thank you. 
that would mean a lot. Um, she's not really on Reddit, and like I know that some people are posting information on the, on the Go channel about you know different releases and the change logs she's been working on, and she doesn't even really see the feedback from the community. So if you use VS Code and um, you use it for Go, I would really uh, suggest you you send her a quick little message to say thank you because she's working really hard on that. That's awesome. Currently, there looks like there's 91 open issues. So yes, if you really want to show love, help triage, or submit pull requests. And most of these issues are usually related to debugger, to using the debugger and uh, helping people debug what the problem is and then making the documentation a bit better. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do by also showing you f- your favorite feature and doing a small GIF or blog post about it so people can learn about it. Uh, but most of the issues are very straightforward and you can just go through them and help. And if you want to help with the code, it's TypeScript, which looks a lot like Go. Um, it's not really hard to write. And most of the, the work is actually done by calling a Go binary that we install on your machine. Now, this is an unrelated, well, semi-related segue, but why is it that Visual Studio Code feels so much faster than every other GUI editor? Uh, I mean, it, it's hard, right? Because they, they're using Electron, which is the, the, the Chromium framework uh, that's used also by Atom. And actually, it's, it's extracted out of Atom. But I think the editor, the Monaco editor, is what they really optimized to make it feel really, really fast. Um, besides that, I don't, I don't quite know. Yeah, it's it's a dramatic difference on on all three. I've got Windows, Mac, and Linux, and I've been using Visual Studio Code maybe half the time lately, and I just I can't get over how fast it is compared to everything else. Right. Are you using that with the Vim plugin or no? Yeah, there. Well, yeah, I use the Vim plugin and I use the uh, the Go plugin, and I'm just I'm amazed. It's more responsive than NeoVim for me. It's it's really fast editor. One of these days, I'll actually try it. It's worth it. I'm just so used to Vim. <laughs> yeah, it's really worth it. I, I, and with the Vim bindings, it's it's fine. Although the, the biggest problem I have with the Vim bindings is that there are a dozen different Vim bindings, and all of them are incomplete in one way or another. So that's a little bit frustrating. All right. So my free software Friday is actually going to be React. It's probably changed the way I do front-end stuff. I know you guys use Angular over at Splice, but um, I've used Angular a few times. One of the things I like about React is that I I don't have to be all in. Like um, Angular has seemed to be in the past for me where it's kind of all Angular or or no Angular. But yeah, I mean, it, it really definitely changed the way I do web stuff. Web stuff felt a lot harder coming in from Rails where we were used to kind of like the templating and things like that that existed. So now doing just kind of a JSON API to React makes doing kind of web-based things ridiculously easy. So I know Facebook's doing a ton of work as well as some outside contributors on that. So huge, huge thank you to you guys. Awesome. All right. So with that, I think we're probably over. I wonder if Adam's been yelling at us in the the back, like, shut it down. (laughs) Close it up. I think we're going to need to wrap it up. Right. So uh, uh, definitely thank you for everybody being on the show today, especially to you, Matt, for coming on and talking to us. Uh, a lot of great topics here. Thank you for having me. Huge shout out to our sponsor for today, TopTal. Um, definitely share the show with friends, coworkers, uh, fellow Go programmers. We are at GoTimeFM on Twitter, GoTime.FM on the interwebs. And if you want to be on the show, have suggestions for guests or topics, github.com slash go time fm slash ping and with that goodbye everybody we'll see you next week thanks matt bye thank you thanks everybody bye all right that wraps up this episode of go time tune in live on thursdays at 3 p.m u.s eastern at changelaw.com slash live join the community and slack with us in real time at the changelaw.com slash community Follow us on Twitter. We're at GoTimeFM. Special thanks to TopTal for sponsoring this show. Also, thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner, at thefastly.com to learn more. This episode was edited by Jonathan Youngblood, and the theme music for GoTime is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening.